Bless the Lord. Wow, Sister Bonnie. Whew. There's a pretty powerful message here. Bless your Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, pray that you have mercy on us. Lord, I pray that we realize the value of pray, prayer. And Lord, that we always entreat you, that we always seek you, that we always lift our petitions before you. And Lord, that we pray one for another and pray for all those that are suffering and going through tough times and uh, going through pain, sickness, and all those tough things that life will afford us. So Father, be glorified in your church. Hear our prayers, answer our prayers. Save our nation, save your church, save us individually, save us corporately. Lord, touch our loved ones who don't know you, that they might come to know you. Those that are sick and afflicted, Lord, that they would find health, healing, and well-being, Lord God, and glorify you and offer up a sacrifice of praise. So, Father, I pray that your praise would be continually in our mouths. It would be God-conscious 24-7. They would always be aware that you hear what we say. You know what our thoughts are. You see our actions and our deeds. Lord, you witness our attitudes and our posture, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name that all of that would be pleasing to you, that we would behave as your children, as your children who have been raised by you, who have matured and settled in and become children of the Most High God, saints, saints, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bless the Lord. Please be seated. You know, the church is supposed to be a, a manufacturing plant to produce saints. You know, it's not to make you better, it's to make you a saint. And the way you become a saint is only by faith, by trusting Jesus Christ totally with your life, putting your life in his hands, and learning of his ways. One reason you come to church is to hear the word. That's the reason, the main reason here, yes, we're here to praise the Lord. Yes, we're here to have fellowship. Yes, we're here to pray for one another. We're here to do a number of things, even drink coffee together. We're here to do that. But we're here to learn the word, to hear the word. And, and without the word, you're going to be just floundering out there. You know, this is the word of God. It, I, I've been reading the history lately of uh, uh, the restoration coming out of the dark ages and that was all about this book. You know, when this book isn't available, when this book isn't read and his kingdom isn't revealed through his word, you have darkness, you have uh, oppression, you have misery. Uh, things go, this is the light of God's word. Now, let me say this. Thank God for the book. But the only way you can understand that book is put your faith in Jesus Christ and be filled with his spirit. And when you're filled with this spirit, this book will come alive to you because it is the word of God. It was inspired of God. Men have died protecting this. Men have, have been persecuted and burned at the stake because, on account of fighting for this book. You know, the, the, the book for a lot of years was uh, only, the, only the church had it and, and it wasn't available to the public. And so nobody knew for sure what the book was saying, and you didn't even know if you, what you're being preached to is right. By the way, if I preach to you something contrary to this book, leave. If you go to church that doesn't preach the book, what are you doing there? You're going there to hear the Word of God. You're not going there to do your religious doo doo. You know, like, well, I went to church today, so I'm going to heaven. I wish it was that easy. You know, go up here and the pastor tap you on the head, and you're going to heaven because, well, you came to church today. You have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You have to apply the word to your life. It, if you think that you can walk around and you have contempt in your heart, or you're thinking thoughts like, uh, boy, this guy's that, and this is that, and man, you know, what a phony. I, it, you know, no matter what you're thinking, God hears your thoughts, and he will deal you accordingly. And you'll go, well, I never said this or that. <laughs> you thought it. Your attitude calls for God. Do you understand your attitude reflects a spirit and the Holy Spirit in that clash? God's going to deal with you. The only spirit's the right spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Every other spirit has to go. Your spirit, you got, when you were born again, your spirit married the Holy Spirit. And 
You being the wife, submit to your husband. Come on, church. You, the church, is the wife. We're the bride of Christ. We submit to our Heavenly Father. The only way we know our Heavenly Father, He has given us His Spirit. Jesus died to forgive your sins so that the Spirit could come into you. You're born again of the Spirit. And you walk in the Spirit, you live in the Spirit, and your Spirit needs to become one with the Holy Spirit where there becomes no difference. The Bible says about a marriage, the two become one flesh. And it's sad to say, you know, we're not being a good example of Christ and the church when we can't make our natural marriages work. You know, how, how, how powerful is the devil? That powerful. Come on, a whole number of people, we've had strained marriages, we had divorces, we've, we've, we've we're gone through life, our children turn out bad, they turn out good, everything's up and down. Why do you think that is? It's because the grace of God comes in abundance to those who walk in faith. Are you married and submitted to the Holy Spirit? Now, what do I mean by that? If, if I have a thought like, I say I'm watching TV, and some commentator makes a statement I don't agree with, and I go, what an idiot. I don't know if that guy's an idiot. That's my opinion. And I expressed it in the hearing of God. Not maybe in the hearing of my wife, maybe not even out loud, but pff, this, this, stupid, this guy is stupid. Guy might have an IQ of 180, and I got an IQ of 78, but he's stupid. You don't know. When the Bible says, judge not, guess what it means? Don't do that. You know, you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I can sow seed and I can tell you what the book says, but you have to work it out. I pray there's times you go, don't, quit that. Stop it in Jesus' name. I hope you minister to yourself. You know, you can't always just call pastor or you can't always call an elder. Was, hey, pray for me. You know, I'm doing it again. Why are you doing, quit doing it. I like that show, uh, the comedian, he, uh, Bob Newhart, the lady come to him, laid out all her problems, and she said, don't you think she should take notes? Oh, well, you know, should I write it down, what you're going to tell me? He goes, yeah, you can. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. If, you're doing, if you get a wrong attitude, if you're discontent, if you're full of complaint, if you're miserable, just stop it. Try glorifying the Lord. Try blessing the Lord. Lift your petition to him with a hope and expectancy that he's going to answer it. And the song you just sang, Sister Bonnie, I pray everybody, I pray everybody in here, I would hope that you've been on your knees just saying, help Sister Little Lord. Help Brother Allen. How many of you know that he's going through heart-wrenching times? He's probably going through a tougher time than Lil is. I've seen Lil and she's not doing great, but she's, hmm, she got that spirit of, she does. She said, Praise the Lord, Sister Lil. Praise the Lord. She smiles at you. But man, Alan, he's just, he's watching his mate. They've been married a long time. They don't fight. I've never counseled their marriage. And they've been here the whole time. They've been here from, I've never counseled their marriage. You know why? They haven't needed any. Those two have become one. And Alan feels like something's being torn away from him. And it is. So pray. And I, I would encourage you. I don't, I don't know how you pray with you. I pray you always full prayer. If you drive in your car and you think of somebody, say, bless them, Lord. And just, you do that always. That should be the normal thing. But I pray that either in the morning or at night, or you, you have a time when you go and you get on your knees and you say, God, help so-and-so. Lord, help me. Lord, bless my family. Lord, whatever is the burden of your heart, just share it on the Lord. Give some knee time to this. Well, I prayed. We don't, we don't have to kneel down and pray. See, even that thought. We don't have to kneel down and pray. I can pray when I'm driving my car. Yeah, you can. But you mean you don't care enough to take some time and get on your knees and say, God, help my brother. Help my sister. Heal my brother. Heal my sister. Lord, have mercy. This is the body of Christ. We're connected one to another. We're to love one another. Come on, we have Sister Jeannie lost her husband. Yes. Had a great marriage. Said to me on the phone the other day, Pastor, this is hard. I know, Jeannie. It should be hard on all of us.
because you got brothers and sisters that are suffering, who go through tough times. When, it, when a family gets upside down, when a husband and wife are fighting, when the child is going off the deep end, it ought to burden your heart and say, God, help us. Don't get so self-righteous. If God's blessed you, realize God's blessed you. It's not because you're such a wonderful person. You might have been smart enough to just humble yourself, say, Lord, I'm, <laughs> help me. I don't know what to do here. Every day, you know, I pray. I have a burden for, for a week. In fact, there's time my wife goes, what's wrong? You see, nothing is wrong. Something is right. I said, I have a burden that I carry 24-7. It's for the church. I have a burden that, Lord, I don't want to misguide. I don't want to misdirect. Lord, I want to speak the truth. Lord, I don't only want to speak the truth. I want to be an example of the truth. I want to live the truth. I don't want to be hypocritical at all. I don't want to say, you do this and I don't do it. My God, that's dangerous. I fear the wrath of God and I fear God. And that's such a holy, awesome fear. If you fear God and you fear that, because you know what we're saved from. We're saved from the wrath of God. And I don't have that flippant attitude. Well, I'm saved. I believe in Jesus. What are you, in ozone? But you violate the word. You gossip about each other. You criticize each other. You condemn each other. And you think it's okay because I'm right. Be careful. I think one of the greatest gifts you can have from God is this. Be still and know that I'm God. What's that mean? You know, when there's nothing going on in your heart but You ever just sit down and, hmm, what are you thinking about? Nothing? Who, who ministered to me? Wasn't even trying to minister. When Johnny got baptized, we was sitting in that baptism, said, what are you doing, John? Just enjoying Jesus. Amen. His presence. It's that peace that passes understanding. The goodness of God just sitting on you. Jesus died to give me his spirit. I received the Spirit. Now I have the authority of my Father ministering to me. I got a God in heaven that loves me, and man, I have fallen in love with him. I didn't even know how to love, and he taught it. He teaches you love is patient, love is kind, love doesn't count a wrong suffering, love doesn't judge a brother. We just look for each other's interest. My, my. Bless the Lord. Be a spiritual being. Do what you're supposed to do. You know what? And it's, it's not that demanding and it's not rocket science. Thank goodness, because us dummies would have a hard time getting saved. But it doesn't take a high IQ. Thank God. My IQ is what God gave me, and that's what I get to use. Ah, my prayers that he'd let me remember names. You know what goes away when you get older? Names. Name. Some of you, are, I get, get, got an amen here, because some of you know that already. You know, you're talking about somebody, you know they're, um, and when they say name, well, that's it. You know, you know, always recognize the name, you just can't call it, you know. And how some of you young guys can remember every football player, every baseball player, every, you know. Can you remember Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, can you, can you do that? How about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, you know. You know, there's a guy named Moses who walked around, we, we need to remember his name, he knocked it out of the park. And before him was a guy named Abraham, he knocked it out of the park. And there was a guy named David, he knocked it out of the park. And Jesus was a grand slam home run. Man, what a Lord we serve. What a God we serve that we can know our God through Jesus Christ. You know Jesus, you know the Father. You know, last week I brought this sermon, and I brought it back again. So I didn't do any preparation this week. I just said, I'm going to do the sermon that I brought to teach last week. And I told Micah, you got to rename last week's. Because <laughs> the name of it is A Woman After God's Own Heart. And I read, I think, three of the scriptures, and it was time to go home. Uh, believe it or not, there's a time God tells you when you're a preacher, that's enough. Cut it. I mean, now most of you probably think you judge it better than I do. And the reason when it, you know, you were probably right, but I can't stop because you're judging it. 
You, th you don't think God would do that? I don't know why you ain't quitting. And I'm ready to quit. And pass the Lord goes, we got to deal with somebody sitting out there who's going. <laughs> They're here, but they know better than pastor. Pastor, you got to quit now. I know that's the Lord for you to quit. I would if you would get it. <laughs> so I got an elder who laughs at me. Yeah, that's good. I love it. We've done well. Sister Jeannie, thank you, and Elder Mike for our elder. I see your influence on his life. I see his dad's too. I want to tell you the impression Elder Mike made on his community. I'm honestly, we're doing the Thanksgiving dinner. We say we're doing, I started it, and then I, I'm one of those guys, I start and I get see, and then I go, see ya. Here, Elder Mike, I think God's calling you to do that. Boy, it's nice when you're a pastor, you know, you go, yeah, it's the Lord. It was given to Mike Smith, and we have another Mike Smith. So he has to do that. But no, it's, you know, people have helped. This community has really got behind the Thanksgiving dinner. And by the way, I know it's been said, but I want you to understand, that is not a charity event. That is a fellowship event. That is for people who, if, if you, you're in this church, and, and you're going to sit home, just you and your husband, or just you by yourself, and you're going to have dinner by yourself, Come down there. It's what it's for. Come down here and have some fellowship. Sit across from somebody. Get to know people. Poor people, rich people, their people come down here. Every, everybody from town. And I think the town, after 25 years, whatever we've been doing, are catching on to that. And Elder Mike always went around, and people say, I'll give turkeys, I'll give this, I'll give that. Year after year, and down at Greek church, they go down there, and the Greeks help, and they cook it and deliver it, and we've got people d driving it here and there. And it's awesome. But th this year, people have been sending money. And I, and I really believe, I don't know, but I really believe it's because of Elder, they miss Elder Mike. And they're sending money. So far, in this last month, $6,000 have been sent for that dinner. That's... Well, Michael, maybe you can get Jeannie to help you, but you got to go shopping. <laughs> Spend that money. Oh, re really, just... Well, what, the Steel Union sent $1,000. That's, I mean, just keep sending check after check. Keep, every time I get up, so what's this? For, for the dinner, for the dinner, for the dinner. So, bless the Lord. We're making an impact in this town. You know, and, and be there. You know, if you're going to go down and help and serve, go do that. But if you don't help and serve, go, go down and sit down and have a piece of pie if you don't want to eat the whole dinner. If you're going to have dinner at your house, fine, that's fine. But, Go down and see what's going on. See how many people show up. I don't know the number, but what's we've fed? Yeah, think of that. We've fed 500 people. It's pretty good. So bless the Lord. And, and this church is a big part of that, and we attribute it to, to the ministerial association because that's where it started. So bless the Lord. Anyhow, let me read these scriptures to you. I got time. I call this a woman after God's own heart or a woman who seeks God. And what the word says about honoring your mother and father and then uh, about just about, about women in general. Just This is awesome stuff. Do you realize you got the book of life? You won't know it works unless you do it by faith. You do it by faith and you'll go, wow. And you'll go, why, why did it wait so long to get this, you know? But here, in the law of God, Moses declared this, honor your father and mother. By the way, Moses declared what God said. Moses went up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights and was with the Lord, and the Lord gave him the tablets. Moses came down, and the people were already doing their thing, drinking, partying, doing stuff they shouldn't do. Moses got angry, threw the stones and shattered them, went back up, brought new stones, and was up there another 40 days and 40 nights. By the way, his fast was no food, no water. He was only living by the grace of God. And God, re, and he re, re got, we got the commandments. And that's them. We still have them. A little more, there's a little more to, we use just the simple statements, but there's, there's more to the commandments. But that is the perfect law of liberty. If society kept those commandments, life would be wonderful. It works. It, it's what made America great. You know, we think it's our democracy, our, our means of government, all that. No, it's because you had godly people. 
Christian people keep the commandments by the grace of God. What do I mean by the grace of God? In my own strength before, I couldn't do it. I'd always mess up, always do something wrong. After being saved, washed in the blood, forgiven of my sins, and filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm now empowered to keep them. Why? That, that what you're seeing there, that is, that's a reflection of the Spirit. That's what God would do. If God was a human and he is in Jesus, that's how he, that's his morality. That's his standard. That's how he lives. And that's the standard that we're supposed to live. And how do you do that? Being filled with the Holy Spirit, which is being filled with the love of God, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given. And by that power of that spirit, I love one another. I serve one another. I don't covet. I don't cheat. I don't steal. I don't lie. I don't do any of those things. And it's not self-righteousness. It's the gift he's given me. Nobody on their own is so good that you should inherit eternal life. All have sinned and shown, fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And if God made an exception for you, then where is the next exception? Come on, think of what, you know, when you were a little child and you went and rolled your eyes and threw a temper tantrum, you were rebelling against your parent. Your nature was a sinful nature. God wouldn't count that as sin because you're ignorant, but it's still, a sin. it's a sinful nature. You know, and what do you do? You spank him, you do what you have to do, and hopefully you bring him to the Lord. But every, you know, the wages of sin is death. God deals with every sin. And he shut up all men under sin. Why did he do that? The wisdom, the, the, the wisdom of God. We're all shut up under sin so that he can show mercy to all. So if all you ever did as a child is say the only time you defiled your parents or defied your parents is when you went. And that was, and that was it. The only time in your life. It's still shut up under sin. But it's that way because the murder, the drug addict, the drunk, the fornicator, the, the, the one who, the, the gossiper, the, everybody who sins when they run to Jesus and say, God, and they, and they humble themselves and, and realize God, have mercy on me. He can, because all are shut up under sin, he can show mercy to all. And when you come to Christ and you humble yourself, by the way, repentance is that you humble yourself. Repentance is that you own up and you face your own sins and you say, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Help me. And when you do that and you're honest and you humble yourself, he'll wash you in his blood. He'll fill you with the Holy Spirit. He'll forgive you and receive you as a, as a son or a daughter of God. And you begin to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. You begin to walk in faith. You begin to overcome the, how do I want to say this? The reluctance of your flesh. You begin to ignore the desires that your flesh wants. And you start doing what God will have you to do. You quit listening to the lies of the devil and you begin to learn the truth. And you're on your way to heaven. You're on your way to victory. You're on your way to knowing God. To have a relationship with him where you call him Father, Abba. God becomes your father. And as a father, he loves you. And he deals with you as a loving father. And there's no son, no daughter without discipline. And by the way, the bride of Christ is the church. So God is your father. The church is your mother. You need to listen to the church's kindness. You need to listen to the word that's taught. You need to listen to the encouragement that you get from one another and grow in grace. So anyhow, so when we read about a woman after God's own heart, you could really say that it's, it's the, also the mindset and the attitude of the church towards our Heavenly Father, towards Christ. So what's to say? Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you. It's not an option. It's a commandment. That your days may be prolonged, that it may go well with you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Thank God we live in a land that he gave us, and it's called America. You know, here he's talking to Israel about giving them Israel. But God is the God of the whole world. And I wish that the left would quit trying to save the earth and realize we need to save people. The earth will take care of itself. It doesn't need our help. Every one of you, it says in Leviticus, shall reverence his father and his mother and his father. You would have respect for your parents. Cursed is he who dishonors his father or mother. And all the people said, Amen. My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. 
She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. When you have a right relationship in the home, the father represents authority, and the, and the wife is supposed to send, represent the grace of God or the kindness of God. You know, uh, when you're raising children, <laughs> it should be fearful for a mom to say to a, a son or a daughter, I'm going to tell your father. It's like, uh, why? Father, it's authority, it's judgment, it's discipline that comes. Kindness comes from your mother. Hey, if you do this and do that, and she teaches you to find favor with, your, with the father. And the same thing with the church. You come to church to learn how to find favor with God through Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's not rocket science. She opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. There's things that our parents teach us that we never realize the wisdom of it till later. Till we're in that situation and go, oh, now I know why mom did that. Now I know why dad did that. In Titus 2, 3, it says this, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior. Now listen to this. Not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. You know why it says that? Anybody figure out why, why it's said in the Bible? Because our tendency is to do those things. What? To gossip maliciously? How can they do it? Do you hear what Sally did? Do you hear? What, look, you see how they treat each other. Did you hear what she said? That's so easy to do. And you, you think you're somebody because, ooh, you know, you're full of contempt because how could they be that way? If you're doing that, you're the devil in church. Why aren't you on your knees praying for him? Why aren't you there encouraging him? Why don't you give him some wisdom? Why don't you go embrace him? Why don't you go have a talk with him? But instead you talk to somebody else. Gossip is sin, church. It destroys churches. It destroys nations. A house divided can't stand. You have that going on and you've got that undercurrent in church and it, you're destroying things in your own home. Don't, don't ever say to your children, don't tell your mom, don't tell your dad. We'll do that. Oh, Dad will be mad. Don't tell him. He has the right to know, and he'll figure it out. Anyhow, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, or enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. Why? Because we're prone that way, and God's telling us to go another way. So that they may encourage, listen to this now, so that they may encourage the young women to what? Love their husbands and to love their children. You would think, why does that have to be in there? Because, you know, you can run out of gas. Your husband can be inconsiderate or insensitive to your feelings. And you'll get to the point like, why am I in this marriage? Why am I putting up with this? Why? It was better when I was home. It was better when I would have... It, that happens. It's, it's in there because we're prone not to do that. And it's in there telling us, no, no, love your husband, love your children. And there's times, you know, there's times you want to spank your children out of discipline. There's other times you want to throw them out the window. That's in there because it's, you're tempted to do that. You say, no, no, honey. You, you know, you, how many moms want to give up raising children until they find out you can spank them? I can hit them and it's okay with God. <laughs> you can have rage and you can have an outburst of anger. But you can discipline them, really, with a stick, which by today it's called a weapon. If you're a woke person, it's a weapon. Hmm. Don't go there, Jim. I'm, I'm, I'm pausing here. I don't want to go there. I want to do this. <laughs> I think you all know what I'm talking about. But what do we need to teach young women to love their husbands? Because your husband can get on your nerves and vice versa. And to love their children because they can get on your nose and out of hand. You, it's, it's amazing. You know what's so amazing? Children are so stinking smart. Their mind's not cluttered with all the stuff we have in our mind. And man, they, they, they'll, they'll work you. Mommy said, Dad said, can I, uh, they, they play you. I always get a kick out of when a little child, their mother tells them something, go, why? And you give them an explanation, go, why? And they give them an explanation. They could. They don't care why. They're they're just playing with you. You know. I mean, it's it's a shame when you got outfoxed by a three-year-old. I mean, it's just jeez. 
but I love them so much. So you're being in ozone. <laughs> but we're to teach the young women also what? To be sensible. Y you mean you have to teach that? It says it. I, now I know why. I remember my, one, I went to one church in a, at a Bible study. The pastor's wife said, Paul was an arrogant little Jew that hated women. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> you know what, honey? I bet he don't like you. <laughs> I mean, man, the apostle to, to us Gentiles, he's telling us how to live. Man. You know, thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Word. And thank you for the Apostle Paul. Because he ministered to Gentiles. He told us things that the Jews already knew. But what? To be sensible, pure. Uh-oh. Workers at home. Hmm. Jeez. Kind. How about this one? Being subject to their own husbands so that the Word of God will not be dishonored. Again, and I've said it many times, and I preach it often, that it's to be a reflection of Christ in the church. When you see a good marriage, you can understand how Christ in the church, how, how we are the bride of Christ and how we can function, how we can honor God who the we even don't see, but we honor his authority, we honor his word, and we're subject to that. We live our life under his rule and under his authority because it's such a blessing. And he also says to the ladies, and let not your dormant be merely external. You know, hey, you want your hair to look nice, you want the nice nails, you want nice clothes, that's okay, but don't let it, if, if that's your main thing, the main thing is to have that quiet, gentle spirit. It says, let not your dormant be merely external, braiding of the hair, or wearing a gold jewelry, and putting on dresses. Well, we don't, in America today, we don't too often put on dresses, except maybe when you come to church on Sunday, that's a nice thing. Boy, you're quiet out there today. You're quiet. <laughs> I'm just reading it to you. See, it's written there. <laughs> Pastor don't like slacks. I'd rather you wear dresses. <laughs> I would. Do, do, I, do you wear slacks? It's between you and God. And, and, and what years ago we said, try to make them girly, but you can't do that today. I remember we first talked about, really, some of the ladies got together and we talked about slacks. You want to wear slacks. I don't have a problem with slacks. I have problems. You want feminine and masculine. Do you understand? That's what we're after. So back then it was, you know, they used to, like in the 50s and 60s, and zippers determined that. If the zipper was in front, a guy wore it. If it was on the side and the back, it was girl clothes. Duh, easy. So even if the clothes looked like, if the zipper was there, it made it masculine and feminine. Do you, do you understand? God wants us masculine and feminine. He wants her to be distinguished even in our clothes. He wants that. That's his desire. So I remember we had the meeting, we talked about it, and we come up with this great idea. Girls were wearing the, the, the pants that had the, the glitter right here, where guys like to look, you know. <laughs> and, and we thought, well, that's kind of girly, and they had little fancy things on. We said, well, okay, they're girly. And we said, okay, we'll go with that. Instead of the zippers, because you can't find clothes with the zippers in the places and all, I wish somebody would bring them back. It was easier. And, you know, I bet it wasn't a month later I look and there's guys walking around with the same pants on. Go, oh, guys, jeez. You make it so tough. Well, we had, we had the fancy ones first. <laughs> it used to be girls wore pink. Now you watch your favorite golfer out there with pink pants on like... <laughs> Do you understand that the world don't want, want to distinguish between the sexes? He wants us all to be unisex. You know, it's easy for, barbers can do a lot better if everybody just cuts their hair the same, you know. Just. Here's the sad part. The Christian, the Christian church, and I, and I don't mean this in a condemning way. I just, my brother says this often. He, he says, and I like this saying, he says, the, the devil's not good, but he's good at what he does. He's a deceiver. He dupes us into believing it's okay. And he's duped the church into accepting this stuff. You know, uh, homosexuality is embraced. It's like you've got to be inclusive. Well, God made him that way. You know he didn't. God made man upright. We seek our own devices. God didn't create us sinners. We become sinners. That's our own free will. 
But anyhow, let, and let not your dormant be merely external, braiding of the hair, wearing of gold jewelry, and putting on of dresses. Don't let it be just your fingernails and your hair and all that stuff and your nice shoes. But, let it, but what is it supposed to be? Let it be the hidden person of the heart. You don't, it, it's not saying don't do that. It said, but don't let it just be that. Don't let all your femininity be just by what, outward. It has to be what? The hidden person of the heart. And I've read this so many times, and I've looked this up in every English tra translation. Every English translation, what it says up there. But let it be what? With the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. There's probably, I'm guessing, uh, there's probably a hundred. How many English translations of the Bible are there? Dan, what is it? Hundred? Probably, probably, I mean, you get on you get on a, a Bible study on the Bi on the uh, internet, and they'll list all, all the like you do English translations. And there's a list of, and I looked up this scripture in every one of them. You know what? It's, it all says the same thing. It all says, "Let it be the hidden person of the heart." Not exactly these words, but this the same thought. With it. listen to this imperishable quality. Imperishable. Do you, do you understand that phrase, imperishable quality? You're not going to die and go to hell. What do you think it means? Imperishable. If it won't perish, if that's my spirit and it's not going to perish, I'm going to live forever. But you can do, but you don't know who I'm married to. You already flunked the test. Yeah. I mean, that, that is just, that's salvation. God embraces that. God is moved by that. Examples in the Bible were awesome. You know, yeah, and, I, and I know you, forgive me for saying it often, but, I, you know, I believe not just you. I hope you take this stuff and you talk to people about it because America needs this. The Christian church needs us. We need to resort back to masculine and feminine. We need to have men that stand up and have, are courageous for the Lord. And we need to have women that have this quiet, gentle spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Precious. And then it goes on. It says, for in, for in this way in former times, the holy women also, the holy women who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, See, I, I don't know if you look at that as like, well, that's what we're supposed to do, or that's, you know, that was probably the culture of the day, you know, in, in Israel or in Corinth, you know, that's, that's what they did, so we didn't want to upset the apple cart. It's not true. The Corinthian women and Corinthian men didn't live this way. They needed salvation. My God, us Christians don't even do that. I really wish some people would do it without me goading. You know, I would love to see some people just on their own doing that and, and then don't get self-righteous. Well, I do that. Well, now you're, you know, don't let your righteousness be sin to you. Bless the Lord. Listen to this. Proverbs 31 talks about an excellent wife. Listen to this. An excellent wife who can find question mark. You know why it's, uh, there's a question mark? Ladies, I hate to tell you uh, out there, but you're not out there a dime a dozen. An excellent wife is hard to find. And it's one who's going to have a precious spirit, who's going to be gentle, who's going to be quiet, who's going to respect her husband. That's an excellent wife. An excellent wife, who can find? Question mark. For her worth is far above jewels. Every, any Christian man that has an excellent wife knows that he has a, a jewel better than any jewel ever founded on the earth. His life is enhanced. His life is better because of an excellent, excellent wife. How do you find one? Well, <laughs> most guys in the world look in a bar. The wise man goes to church. You have a shot of getting an excellent wife there. I don't know if you got that. You have a shot. That's an anointed insult. 
Hope you know I love you. Because I really do. And I think you're a great church. And I think we... I think we're going to be an example to Christians everywhere and to this country where our country needs help bad. I mean, the, the devil's out in the open now. I mean, this woke stuff, what they're trying to teach in schools, what they're doing to mutilating boys and girls and telling them that they're wrong, say, geez, it's, it's insanity. It's insa but that's what happens. When we lower the standard, inch by inch by inch by inch, that's what happens. An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. The heart, listen to this, the heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. You want, to, you want your husband to prosper? Be a good wife. God says he'll have no lack. God will see to it. Why? Because he'll bless you through your husband. I, I hope my wife's finances is, is blessed because of me. That she has her own money and her own and can do her own thing can have her own independence. It's awesome. Why? In, in, I, I believe this goes on my own, my own life. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. I've been married for 61 years, and I don't know my wife ever did evil to me, on, not on purpose anyhow. I can't say I've never been upset, but it was never intent. She looks for wool and fac, flax. She goes to Kroger's. And works with the delight of her hands. She runs a vacuum sweeper once. No, she doesn't. She gets Grace to do it, Stephanie to do it. But what's nice, because I've prospered, we can do that. But I also don't cut my own grass. I have a wonderful neighbor who cuts it, and we pay him. My yard looks nice all the time. That's part of the prosperity. <laughs> She's like merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. From Wharton Heights to Marlin Heights. <laughs> Kroger's to 3605. She rises while it is still night, especially when the days are short, and gives food to her household. That's me. And she has no maidens to give portions to. Don't need any. <laughs> I don't know if she would want maidens living in our house. Anyhow, she, she considers a field and buys it, so she has her own money. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arm strong. So it, it, what we are seeing here, you know, it, it, being a homemaker is a full-time job. And what's showing here, ladies, you can be industrious and make money. It's, it's okay to do that. You, know, you don't have to always go out and just get a job. Be creative. We live in a free enterprise system. You know, figure a way to make money. Well, I like her. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She's ambitious. She stretches out her hand to the staff, and her hand grasps the spindle. By the way, she's doing weaving. She's making stuff. She extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. Well, I don't know about scarlet, but anyhow, she can go get you the good deals at Gabriel's if you can't afford it buy you, you know, good food, still make you look good. But that's what you do, you know. Uh, my wife's back was hurting the other day, so I helped her wash clothes. I said, Man, I had to be taught. I don't know how to wash clothes. I, oh, in fact, I turned on a machine that was doing the wrong thing. She says, no, you got to do this arrow and that arrow and all that. And then help her put the clothes in, clean clothes out. Uh, you know, after 60 years, I think it's about time I did something. Well, she was able to all the other time. She never even asked me. Now she says, will you carry those clothes upstairs? Yeah, I can do that. I'm her hero. Boy, what a, geez, I'm get struck by lightning up here. I want to trade places. Uh, how about this? She makes coverings for herself. Hmm, hope that's a head covering and other things. Her clothing is made of linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. I pray that this excellent wife will have an excellent husband. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the trademen. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. Whoever said anything about being weak, what is it? Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. 
not worried about the news. She don't come unglued because there's a war going on in Ukraine. She just does what you have to do, trusting the Lord. I remember one time I this strength and dignity of her clothing, and she smiles at the future. My brother Tony and I, we stopped at my Uncle Frank's house, and he wasn't home, but my Aunt Julia was there. And we were probably in our 40s, and she was probably in her 70s. And she goes, you guys like a, a oh, I don't know, with some fruit grown in California, it's real good. But let's say a peach. It wasn't a peach, but she says, oh, we'd like some fresh peaches. We're like, fresh. yeah, that sounds good. She goes, okay, I'll get you one. And she walks away. I thought she was going to the refrigerator or something. Down over the hill in her backyard, I mean, down over the hill in her backyard, it was a peach tree down there. She went down over, down over the hill, got peaches, come up the hill and washed them, cleaned them, gave them us peaches. I said, not a word. Not, you know, strength and dignity. I mean, she just was delighted to do it. She goes, oh, God. I said, Aunt Ju Julie, why'd you go down? We could go down there and get the peaches. She goes, God gives me strength. Okay. You got to have a lot of strength. You're married to Uncle Frank. <laughs> God used Uncle Frank <laughs> quite a bit. I said, man. My Uncle Frank, when he, 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 like if you had dinner with him, as long as he was talking, everything was fine. As soon as he quit talking, you start talking, he fell asleep. <laughs> if his mouth was moving, he was sleeping, you know. It was, but he could, test, he could tell stories, talk about my grandma and all that. That's just really great. In fact, read the book, Hey God, he wrote it. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of the kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She's not lazy. Her children rise up and bless her. I don't know if there's anything more fulfilling in life for her, your children to rise up and bless mom, this love mom. Her husband also and praises her saying, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Now listen to this. Get this. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. You know, when you're young and you get yourself looking all dolled up and you think that's what got you a husband, it's not what keeps a husband. What keeps a husband is that quiet, gentle spirit, that wife who takes care of what she needs to take care of, does her duty and does it well. That's the one who the husband will say, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands. Let her works praise, praise her in the gates. For in this way, in, excuse me, for in this way in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being submitted to their own husbands. By the way, you realize if you're submitted to your husband, God got you covered and he got your back. He, you know, even if your husband is, this, is a jerk or whatever, he will take care of you. He, he, he can guard you. The examples in the word prove that. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children if you do what is right without being, listen to this, without being frightened by any fear. You have to trust God. If you don't trust God, you can't, you can't do this. Same with a guy. I can't love my wife like Christ Church without his grace. You can't be that kind of wife without the grace of God. But pursue the grace of God. Don't just say, I can't do that, so I'm not going to do that. God, just go to have taken me the way I am, God. I don't know, he might say no to that. Jesus died that we might grow in grace, that we might change, that we'd be conformed to the image of Christ, that we would behave as children of the Most High God. And God is glorified with this type of behavior. The world would be envious of it. The world would be envious of it. Our marriages at their worst are better than the world's. What would they be at our best? It would be, man, that's it. Guys, guys get married. Why is it this? That's what I've always wanted. Well, let him see it. Let me read that again. Thus Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. You're called to walk in faith just like everybody else is. What an adventure, though, to walk in faith and where you can say, look what the Lord has done, and you begin to see his handiwork. It's, it's awesome. You're blessed. Let your father and your mother be glad and let her rejoice who gave you birth. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord and forget none of his benefits. Heals all your diseases, forgives your sins, covers you with his grace. That's the God we serve. Bless the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, pour out your spirit. Fill us with your grace. Lord, let us be those who love and embrace your word and through the power of the Holy Spirit perform it. Lord, it becomes natural to us to do these things, to love our wives, to respect our husbands, to love one another, to train up our children the way we should, to work and do our jobs as unto the Lord, to live this life to your glory. And Lord, I pray that you're glorified in each and every life in here. Lord, no matter what mistakes we've made in the past, no matter what we've done wrong, today is the day of salvation. Today we can start afresh and anew and pursue you with all of our hearts, with all our souls, and with all of our might. So Father, bless as only you can. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Love one another. Glorify the Lord. Praise Ben. Please come.